good morning, my brothers and sisters. We pray and trust that all is well with both you and your family. I want to cordially thank you for sharing with us today on behalf of Christ Fellowship Church here in Augusta. And we'd like to send kudos out to all of you who take time out to review or listen to or take part of our worship by way of YouTube. Today's message will come from Isaiah the sixth chapter, and we're going to look at the first verse. Now, before we read God's word today, as always, we're going to invite you to pray with us as we seek God's face and his direction for our lives. Can you pray with me? Eternal God, our Father, we thank you for things being as well as they are. God, once again, we bow in humble submission. And God, we're here to give you the praise. And God, we're here to give you the glory. We want to thank you today, God, for things being as well as they are, because when we look back in retrospect, all of our good days yet still outweigh our bad. And for that, we say thank you, Lord. We pray a special prayer today over all families across this nation, not just the rich, not just the poor, not just the white, the black, or the Hispanics, but God, we pause now in the midst of uncertainties, and we pray for families all across this nation. We pray now, God, that you will strengthen them where they're weak and, Lord, build them up where they might be torn down. God, we always pray for our leaders. And with that being said, we pray for our president. We pray for his cabinet. God, we're praying for leaders across this nation. We ask today in Jesus' name that you have your way in us and through it. Get in the minds and the hearts of all of our leaders and have them to do what you would have them to do. God, we speak victory over our nation. We speak victory in our lives today. Have your way in us and through us. Now we look back and we say, thank you, Lord, because all of our good days yet still outweigh our bad. And for that, we're grateful today. God, we're praying for those who are struggling financially. We speak a financial breakthrough in their lives. But most of all, God, we ask that your perfect will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then, God, we pray for the sick and the shut-in across this nation. There are those who are confined to hospitals. And we're not sending you, Lord, where you already are. We just ask for your healing hands. Touch like only you can. Heal like only you can. And then, God, as always, we pray for churches that are gathered in your name. Strengthen every church that might be struggling right now under this pandemic. Strengthen every church, God, who's operating even in the midst of uncertainties. We ask that you move in a mighty way and God move in a mighty fashion. We're excited today, God, because we recognize in the midst of darkness, you bring light. In the midst of uncertainty, you bring certainty. And for that, we say thank you. Now, God, as we prepare to hear from heaven through your word, let the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, be accepted in thy sight, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. In Jesus' name I'm praying, amen, amen, and amen. Once again, we want to thank you for sharing with us today, and we pray and hope that something will be said through God's word that will bless your heart as it did mine. Again, we invite you to look now. Isaiah the sixth chapter and we want to start reading at the very first verse and I'll be reading from the New International Version. That's Isaiah 6 starting at the first verse and I'm reading from the New International Version. These words are printed for our hearing. Isaiah 6 and 1 says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet. And with two he did fly. And one cried to another and said, Holy, 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 the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. So I said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I'm a man of unclean lips, and I have dwelt in the midst of people of unclean lips. 
for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphims flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the thongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away, and your sins are purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Hear am I, send me. And he says, Go tell this people. May God bless his red word, and we pray and trust it will bless you as it blessed me. I just want to pull out of this particular passage that one particular verse when it says, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Today, we want to tag the text and simply talk about you don't have the right to remain silent. You don't have the right to remain silent. Now, for those of you who've been following along with us during our Bible study, you will know that you will remember and you can recall this is our central theme for our Bible study here at Christ Fellowship Church. A 10-week series as it's entitled, You Don't Have the Right to Remain Silent. And my brothers and sisters, as we engage this passage, we will discover why we don't have the right as born-again believers to remain silent. God is speaking to us today. And God is saying to the band of baptized believers, I need my people to speak up. Matter of fact, I need my people to say a word on my behalf. When we engage this passage, there are several things that have already taken place. This passage was birthed out of a time when the death of King Uzziah, at the time of his death, we will note that it had ushered in the end of what we call great prosperity. People were living large. But at the time of this king's death, who had reigned some 52 years, it came to the end of prosperity. It was a time of uncertainty. At the time of his death, it was a time of change. Fear had gripped the hearts of God's people. A leader who had led 52 years was no longer in place. And although God was still speaking to man through all of the other prophets, somehow, like today, people were not listening. And God is saying to us today, as a group of band of baptized believers, he's saying to all of us, I need someone to speak up on my behalf. There was a divine call for someone to tell God's people about the ways of God to tell God's people about the will of God, to tell God's people about the word of God. And just like today, God is seeking for someone to just tell his story. The body of Christ is to tell the dying world about a living Savior. And if God is commissioning us to tell the world about a living Savior, that lets me know, saints, we don't have the right to remain silent. For God is saying to the band of baptized believers, he's simply saying, tell them what I've already written. He's simply saying, tell them what I've told you. What is God saying to us? God is speaking us, uh, God is speaking to us from Genesis to Revelation. And the only thing God requires of us is to tell his story. For in his story you will find that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. We don't have the right to remain silent. Come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That's in his story. Thou shalt not have no other God before me. That's found in his story. He says, just tell the story. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son. We don't have the right to remain silent. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. 
Matter of fact, when many of us say, well, I don't know what to tell people when I talk about this God, I don't know what to say. Just open your scriptures, open your Bible and just tell them his story. In my father's house, there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would not have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Just tell the story. We don't have the right to remain silent. And once we come into the knowledge of God and who he is and what he has done for us and what he is doing in us, God is saying to the band of baptized believers, he says, I need you to speak up and let somebody know that I still love them. God expects us to respond to what we call a divine call. A divine call that's in our lives, that's on our lives, and for our lives. God is speaking today. Now, so often when we think about a divine call, immediately some people think it's only the preacher, or it's only the pastor, it's only the evangelist, it's only the missionary. Once you accept Christ into your life, you then have a divine call on your life to tell the story. The old saints would say, just let your little light shine. Someone's down in the valley trying to get home. My brothers and sisters, God is saying, even in this particular passage, we've got to learn how to respond to God's divine call. Now, when I look at these eight verses that I read for you earlier, God shows us some very important factors on why it is so important that the saints of God don't remain silent. When we look at this passage, I see, personally I see, some three visions between verses 1 and 8 that Isaiah saw. He said, in the year the king of Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord. So, so, so what I'm looking at here, Isaiah gets a vision of God, but secondly, he gets a vision of himself. And third, he gets a vision of ministry. I want to say that again. There are three visions here. There are three visions between verses 1 and verses 8. He sees a vision of God. He sees a vision of himself. And then, yes, he sees, my brothers and sisters, a vision of ministry. And if you're going to respond to God's call, if you decide that, yes, preacher, you are speaking to me and I don't have the right to remain silent, there are some very basic ingredients found in this passage that will bless your heart. Here it is. When I look at these verses, we see what God saying, even in these three visions that he saw from verse 1 to 8. There's a process that must take place if you will respond, or if you're planning on responding to God's divine call. This whole passage deals with responding to God's call on your life. God has called every one of you who are listening, he has called you to do something to advance his kingdom. So here it is in the text, when we examine this text, stage one in responding to God's divine call is the revelation of God. Isaiah saw God face to face. He had a face to face encounter with God. He says in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord. He was high and lifted up. In other words, in order to speak on God's behalf, in order to respond to the call, we got to be like Isaiah here. He had a revelation of God. In other words, my brothers and sisters, what I'm saying here is very important. Hear this, and many of you have heard me say it over and over again. You've got to see God for yourself. There comes a time in all of our lives, you've got to see him for yourself. Uzziah, Uzziah was now off the scene. And this man, Isaiah, had to see God for himself. The second stage we see here in responding to the divine call is right here in the text. Not only we see the revelation of God, but also we see the realization of God's holiness. 
if you're going to represent the kingdom, if you're going to talk about the kingdom, Isaiah experienced the holiness of God. And through this encounter, guess what happened? The Lord becomes more than an idea. When you experience God, he's more than what somebody has said. He's more than an idea. He's more than a religion. He's more than what you do every Sunday. This man understood the, re the, the, the revelation of God, but he also understood the realization of his holiness. And all of this takes part in responding to God's divine call. All of these things must take place before you can say, I'm going to speak up for God. But not only the revelation, not only the realization, but we see the recognition of his own sinfulness. Isaiah said, woe is me, I am a man of unclean lips. He's saying, before I go out to judge others, before I go out to condemn others, before I go out to send everybody else to hell, he said, woe is me, I am a man of unclean lips. He said, my lips are unclean, that means it's in my heart. And I can't represent the kingdom until God himself purged me. And then we see not only the recognition of his sinfulness, but we see the renewal of his perspective. He says, and the angel touched me, cleansing me, and now I have a new outlook. This is what God is saying. Before you declare, I'm going to speak up on God's behalf, or I'm going to represent the kingdom, we see here in this process, you must be renewed and have a renewed perspective on the kingdom. If you're going to tell the good news, you've got to be in a place where you say, I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was dirty, but now I am clean. And stage five here tells us you've got to respond to the lifestyle. When God calls Isaiah, he steps up and he steps forward. God is saying to us, You've got to respond by your lifestyle. As a pastor and a preacher, I've, I've heard many people say, in the church and out of church, guess what? I've heard people say, you know, uh, pastor, I've been called. I, I've been called. The Lord has called me to do this. And the Lord has called me to do that. I have a calling on my life. Well, the thing is, you may have a calling, but the question is, have you respond to the calling by your lifestyle? Until your lifestyle changes, you cannot answer the call. Because God requires us to change our lifestyle before you can respond to the call. And that's what Isaiah was telling us. He said, my lifestyle changed. So then I can say to God, send me, I'll go. Let's look at the text, if you will. And there'll be some times, watch this. I, I, I like this particular passage, it says, in the very first year. He says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne. I want to stop there. He says, in the year that King Uzziah died. There will be times and some things will have to die before God can cause you or allow you to represent the kingdom. There's some things in your life that must die in your life in order that God give you life. And I want to say that again. Sometimes there's some things that must die in your life in order that God give you life. Here it is in the text. And it's not always physical death is what I'm talking about. It's not always physical. Sometimes God simply wants you to be detached from something or someone that is unhealthy or toxic in your life, that he gives you life. Can I just parenthetically pause? God says sometimes people have to die in your life. People have to die in your life. Not, not necessarily physically. But sometimes God wants you to detach yourself from those people who are toxic, toxic to you. Why? Because you don't have the right to remain silent. And not only that, sometimes God wants you to be detached from emotional ties. Some people are emotionally connected to other things and other people. And God sometimes has to break that emotion or those emotions so that he can give you what you need. Here it is. 
He said, in the year that King Uzziah died, I, I saw also the Lord. D death has to come in order that life shows up. Jesus had to die that we might live. It's in the text. And sometimes God is saying he has to disconnect you. And some people are connected by sense of security. They want to feel a sense of security in someone or something. And God has to remove that person that gives you security. Or you have to remove that money or those items or that object that gives you a sense of security. Because all along without God, that sense of security is actually empty. Anything you have without God is empty. Matter of fact, Solomon says it's all vanity. He said, I've tried it all. I've had it all. But without God, it's empty. And God is saying to us, you don't have the right to remain silent. But before you speak on my behalf, he says something must die. And some of us got to get rid of habits that only pleasures the flesh, while at the same time, it poisons your faith. Many are guilty of having a particular habit or habits that pleasures the faith or pleasures your, faith, your flesh, but at the same time, it poisons your faith and it has to die. And until that happens, God says, I can't use you. God wants to move the wrong stuff out of your life to make room for the right stuff. So somebody's going to be excited about that because God says, I want to empty you out so that I'll be able to fill you up. And in order to empty you out, God says, I must allow some things to die in your life. Why? Because you don't have the right to remain silent. It's in the text. And so, so when we so when your so-called friends walk out on you, it could be God is making room for the better friends. Many people have tried to hold on to people just because you know someone for two years, three years, four years, maybe five years, and all of a sudden they're not talking to you anymore. They walked away. They blocked you on their phone. All, they're no longer friends. Y'all, y'all falling out. Well, that's not always the enemy. As hard it is to believe, sometimes God says that person shouldn't be in your life your entire journey. And I will allow certain things to happen so that you guys could separate because that person must die in your life. And again, I'm not talking about putting people in the grave. That person you got to quit hanging out with. Because God says, I want to elevate you. I want to take you higher. And those that you're hanging around with, you can't go higher until they die in your life. Lord knows I'm speaking to somebody today. So, so for you who are going into this clinical depression because someone has walked out of your life, God says, get a life. God says, I don't care if your wife left you, your husband left you, your best friend left you, and, and you know, all those people used to hang out. They don't want to hang out with you anymore. Let God empty those people out of your life so he can fill your life with some positive all around you. Why? Because you don't have the right to remain silent. He says, he says, he says, I will remove people out of your life. And sometimes God it has to allow certain things to be no longer in your life. And my brothers and sisters, once we all learn the, the first thing of denying self is to die to self, then we won't have a problem. The first step is not only to deny self, deny self, but you've got to learn how to die to self. God says, I want more for you. I want to, I want to give you more. I want to do more for you. So let's go at the text. Let's look at the text. As God speaks to us today, I'm excited about this word because he's speaking to me as well. You don't have the right to remain silent. Uzziah had made, King Uzziah now dead at the time of this particular writing, and he was a man of influence. While he reigned some 52 years, he, he was a godly man. But one day something happened. Uzziah made a mistake by offering incense in the temple. And he was stricken with leprosy. Because although he was the king, 
he was disobedient to God because the king was not allowed in the temple to burn incense. And my brothers and sisters, the best thing to do is to follow God's will and follow God's way for your life. And I promise you, if as long as you're obedient to God, God will make sure he looks after his children. Here it is in the text. And we see here, Uzziah is not dead. King Uzziah is dead. He's no longer on the scene. And Isaiah says, the year he died. Now, now something interesting to me. And that is, Isaiah didn't say he died in 700 B.C. He didn't say he died in 400 B.C. He didn't say he died in 350 B.C. He said, but the year he died, I saw also the Lord. And, and that lets me know what he's saying to us today. He says, I, I, I can't remember the exact date. He says, but I do know this. When Uzziah died, it moved that scale that was in my eyes. And I can see God for myself. He says, I, I listened to Uzziah. I, 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 I followed his lead. But, but when he was no longer on the scene, I had to see God for myself. And because I saw him for myself, Uzziah, Uzziah was not dead. Isaiah says, you know what? I'm going to speak up. It is, God says, to all of us today, as we follow the trend, as we follow the steps of Isaiah, here it is. We don't have the right to remain silent. Why? I'm going to point them out to you. Number one, this is the reason why we don't have the right to remain silent. Point number, point number one is, is what he saw. What he saw. The Bible says he saw God's position. And God's position was he was a God of sovereignty, a, a sovereign God. He, 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 he was... He was above everyone else. An earthly king had died, but the Lord that we serve still reigned. He saw the position of God. When Uzziah died, Isaiah saw God's position. And his position was, he was high and lifted up. And the record says, and his train, meaning his robe, filled the temple. But not only did he see the position of God, he saw the personality of God. It's right here in the text. For the Bible says, the angelic beings in the temple began to proclaim three times, holy, 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 God of heaven. They're saying, look at the personality of God. Notice that they covered their faces with wings because God's personality was so great that they could not themselves Look on the glory of Almighty God. Here it is in the text. And, and Isaiah said, there I saw the Lord finally. I saw his personality. And his personality deserves the honor. Holy, holy, holy. That's the personality of God. Now watch this. He sees the position. He sees his personality. And all of these things begin to come into play where he says, you know what? I don't have the right to remain silent based on God's position alone. He's above all. So I've got to tell the story. But not only that, not only his, his position, not only his personality, but he saw his presence of God. That's what he saw. He says, the presence of God. What do you mean, Pastor Roberts? The house was filled with smoke, meaning the presence of God. You will notice that God's train filled the temple. He says, the post moved. It was filled with smoke and his robe filled the temple. He says the presence of God alone lets me know that when he showed up, the record declared that the post shook. And God is saying, my brothers and sisters, when you come into the presence of Almighty God, you ought to encounter something. And when you ever encounter God on a real, I promise you, You'll walk away and you will declare, you know what? I can't keep this to myself. I don't have the right to remain silent. I don't have the right to keep this to myself. But second point is, we see what he sensed. What did Isaiah sense? He sensed his own condition. After he saw the personality of God, after he saw the power and the presence of God, 
After all of that, this man Isaiah sensed his own condition. For Isaiah saw the Lord, and he immediately recognized in his heart, Woe is me! I am a man of unclean lips. Now, I like what he did. This is what he did. He didn't say, Woe is my neighbor. He didn't say, Woe is them other people. He says, Once I came into the knowledge of God, once I saw him for myself, once I had a personal encounter with God, he says, woe is me. I am a man of unclean lips. And guess what? He says, I recognize my failures. I recognize my faults. I recognize my shortcomings. And because I recognize these things, I'm going to repent. And that's what God is saying to all of us today. Once you come into the knowledge of your shortcomings and all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But he says, once you come into the knowledge of that, he said, woe is me. But guess what? He sends his own cleansing for the Lord, the God himself dispatched an angel, takes some coals off of the altar and purged his lips. What, what, watch what he says. He say, woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips. I can't even get ready, God, to speak on your, your behalf because what comes out of my mouth comes out of my heart. I need you to purge me. I need you to cleanse me. And he sensed the need to be cleansed. And the Bible says, and the angel came down, took a heap, took some coals, and purged this man, Isaiah. But watch this. Here it is. This is the climax of the message. Then we see what he said. He says to God, after his lips were purged, after God cleaned him up, then God speaks to him and says, who will go for us? Who will tell the story? Whom shall I send? And here it is. He says, I am available. Here am I. Send me, O Lord. And that's what God is saying to us today. He said, I need someone that is available. God said, I need someone that I can count on. That's why he says, who will go for us? And Isaiah, after he'd been cleaned up, he says, you know what? He's changed my language. He's changed my walk. He's changed my talk. He's changed everything about me. He raised his hand before God and says, send me, I'll go. And he says, Lord, not only am I available but he says, I am agreeable. In other words, Lord, here am I. Send me. I will go. I will go and tell man. I will go and let the world know that God still reigns. God still sits on his throne. God is still in control. Hear me today, saints. As we engage this passage, God is speaking to all of us today. In these unsettling times. In these times of darkness, in this time of craziness, in this time of chaos, God is still speaking to the prophets. He's still speaking to his children. He's still asking the question, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And God is looking for someone that will raise their hand and say, send me, I'll go. Why? Because after all that God has done for you, you don't have the right to remain silent. What has he done for me, preacher? Let me tell you what God has done. And I want to just use my sanctified imagination. God, guess what he does? Every night you lay down and go to sleep. God places us on what I call a divine life support. And what he does is, when you don't even know you're breathing, God allows you to breathe. That lets me know you're on divine life support. And then God takes you off of divine life support after you've slept all night long, and he allows you to see another day. And he wakes you up. Not, not only do he wake you up, then God has blessed us to wake up not only to new grace and new mercy, but guess what else he does? We're still close in our right mind. You don't have the right to remain silent. And then God allows us to put our feet on the floor and start a new day. And guess what he does? He leads us. He guides us. And if you pray to the Father, he will protect you throughout your day. You don't have the right to remain silent. Woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips, but Lord, 
purge my lips that I'll be able to tell the dying world that a Savior yet lives. That's what God is saying to us today. We don't have the right to remain silent. This world is upside down, and God said, I'll turn it right side up if my people will go for me and let this world know that I'm still God. That's, God, that's the only thing God is asking of you today. He's saying, can you just take a time out and pause on your busy schedule? God is saying to you today, I need someone to speak up on behalf of the kingdom. I need someone I can count on to tell my story. I need somebody to tell the story that I gave my only begotten son. I need somebody to tell the story that my son died for the remission of all sins. I need somebody to tell that story that he laid in a grave for three days and got up on the third day morning. I need somebody to tell the story that I have given my son all power in his hand. Tell the story that my son sits on the right side of me, interceding on their behalf every day. God said, just tell the story. Who will go for us? Whom shall I send? And God says, I need somebody to tell the story. Why? Because God's people don't have the right to remain silent. May God richly bless you. May God richly keep you is my prayer. I am excited because I'm still telling the story. Even when I don't feel like it, I have to tell somebody that a Savior yet lives. We're going to pray with you today. And we're going to ask God to come into your life. Just in case you don't know him in the pardon of your sins. We're going to ask God to bless you today. And to come into your life. Will you bow with me once again? Eternal God, our Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the visitation of the Holy Spirit. And God, as we bow right now, somebody is listening to my voice saying, come into my heart, God. And we want y'all to repeat this prayer. Lord, come into my heart. Lord, I am a sinner. But God, I repent of all of my sins. And God, I believe in my heart that your son died for the remission of all sins. And God, I believe in my heart that he rose the third day morning. And God, I believe in my heart that I'm confessing to you and you're just to forgive me. Come into my heart now, come into my life, and God, lead me in the way that you have me to go. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen, and amen. May God richly bless you is my prayer. I am excited. You can tell. I'm excited because I'm still telling the story that a Savior yet lives.